Hello and welcome to episode eight of Analyst Ball with myself, Richard Ogando, and of course, um, Colin Sisson. Um, we're going to have a little chat today about a few things that are probably going off in the background at, at Knotts. So for those viewers or, or listeners that are probably aren't Knotts fans, if you can just forgive us our indulgence for this one episode, because it, it's quite an, an important one as for us as fans anyway. Um, so how are you, Colin? Okay. Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Yeah, we um, we had a very brief meeting, didn't we, at, uh, at the weekend, uh, just sort of like managed to pass each other with a very quick one sentence review of of the performance so so how did you now that we've got a bit more time to talk about it how did you yeah. uh, how did you feel the game went oh it's the usual thing isn't it that we've seen a little bit of a pattern emerging now where um and and it's stating the obvious because everybody's saying it but obviously the slow starts and are not really sort of turning it on until the second half and it's something that i mentioned in the stats reports probably a few games ago that i was concerned that we really weren't threatening enough um, in the early stages. Um, and it's nearly cost us in a couple of games. But then when we turn it on second half, we seem to have plenty in our arsenal to to make sure that, that, that we get what we need to get out of a game, which I suppose is promising. So, you know, it just begs the question, what could we achieve if we got that early goal? You know, a goal the first five, ten minutes or so settle the team down and then really allow them to try and press on and express themselves a little more. Um, we have got the kind of players um, that would probably go out there and, and give us, you know, that kind of hammering that we're looking for again. Like, not like the Barnet one, because that was all second half again. But, you know, it'd be nice to be going in at half time, uh, feeling quite comfortable in the game rather than thinking this could go either way. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And I think it's really easy isn't it at the moment to kind of sit back knowing that we've got the three points um to actually reflect on it and go oh you know credit to credit to Ian Birchnell for being proactive with substitutions again changing shape again um you know seeing that kind of fluidity that that knots offer when you know previous versions of knots have probably been a little bit kind of one direction and and kind of you know one or two shapes and quite limited in the way that they they approach games um but at the same time, you know, we, we have, I have to try and remember about the, you know, about the games where actually it, it felt quite uncomfortable at, at certain moments. Yeah. And, you know, I think we we felt the crowd turn in a little bit, you know, I, I, and the last couple of games, I'm not saying necessarily incredibly negatively, but just you've got a sense of the groans about, you know, the ball being passed sort of sideways and those sort of things with what they felt was a was a lack of progression, really. Um, I'm, I, my attitude to it. It's not so much. I'm not concerned about those kind of balls left to right and those sort of things. I think what let us down a little bit was even though we'd gone for it with two options up front, and obviously we were talking to Walid, weren't we, on the, on a previous pod about kind of how the forward players have evolved, not just at knots, but you know across the country and across football, really, in terms of what we expect of them and their skill set. But one of the things that I felt probably needed to happen a little bit more is the ball to be held up there. You know, if we've got if we've got two players. You know high in the final third we need them really that when the ball's played in to keep it to, to enable those players to kind of catch up and to eventually overload the defense i felt like it was coming off them a little bit too you know too much you know too readily which meant that we you know we were constantly back and forth you know it was a bit of a kind of almost like a basketball game as a, as a yeah. result of that you know yeah. in terms of it in terms of it being like that and and i think we'll come on to the you know to the the shape that seems to be Ian Birchall seems to be coming back to constantly, which is that kind of three, three centre backs. You know, those three centre halves, and 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 utilising that as a really solid base to build from, uh, to allow players higher up the pitch to probably take a few more risks. You know, because I think when you do play with a four, particularly the players in the centre are very conscious of the fact that one slip up, you know, one risky pass, one risky ball. And you've exposed, you know, only two players centrally, and and you know you yeah. can end up with a two v two, for example. So, um, lots lots to kind of divulge and take into. And like I say, you know, whereas I can, I can sit back on on days like today or evenings like today and kind of um, be intrigued by the tactical discussions. There were certainly some moments, in, uh, you know, in the recent games certainly where it didn't feel like comfortable watching. No, and I, and I think you're right as well that because of the way that. Um, certainly in the last game, um, and, and, and in some respects, you have to give credit to Maidenhead in that first half 
um, just for the way that they stuck to their task because, you know, they sat there with a, a four and a five, two banks, you know, making it very difficult for Notts to, to actually break through the lines and, and play the kind of expansive play that they want to. And the only way that they could have any success in that was obviously to try and overload the flanks and, and spread the ball a bit and, and do it that way. Or, or with, with, with the, 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 uh, the fullbacks obviously pushing on and, and probably running after a, a ball over the top or something. But of course, we lose the ball in those situations and, and we saw it happen. There were three or four occasions where that happened. We lost the ball. And it does leave you then exposed at the back with, with just a couple of central defenders, you know, uh, up against a couple of, of, of quick guys. I mean, I was watching Sam Barrett, who they'd got playing a really interesting role because he was playing further out wide than I think he we'd normally seen him in the past. And in the first half, Joel Taylor really struggled, really struggled with Sam Barrett when he was dropping down doing his defensive duties. Um, and then he had the better of him as well, I think, as you know, when they were on the break. Um, but that all changed in the second half, obviously, when when we mixed things up a little bit and managed to get some success. Again, the early goal in the second half, the confidence came back again. There was that element of relief, and and they started playing with a bit of freedom again, and, and we started carving open some really good opportunities. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, Taylor. Is a player that i like an awful lot and obviously we, we've touched upon that kind of uh, mm. left hand side slot as well on previous pods as well because it was an interesting kind of recruitment decision to bring him in i think one of the one of the benefits that he does actually is he's very aggressive in terms of going forward but he won't very often let it go to his head in the sense of like you know if he gets himself into attacking positions he's very composed mm. very often i've seen left hand side players sort of you know playing those wing backs they'll get to the the opposing fullback and they'll want to beat them and cross at the byline and those sort of things and very often you'll see taylor actually stop cut the ball back inside play a short ball player one two and i think it's that composure that actually was just missing a little bit you know yeah. in terms of saturday you know that and some of it was circumstantial i think it was down to you know the pitch was a bit greasy we had a bit of rain those sort of things and so there was there was little bits of that that you know like i say i think it took all a lot of players not just taylor a, a little bit of time to to adjust to but you're right you know i was looking down that flank in the family stand particularly you know they're, they're attacking towards this in the in the first half and i felt it was a real sort of standout area that that really needed to develop and again going back to what i was saying previously in virtual gets them in at half time changes the the shape slightly not necessarily the personnel but just the shape and, and kind of readjusts realigns things and, and and they came out second half looking a little bit more in control yeah. um yeah but like i say i i think equally what what we're seeing and we, what you were talking about barrett is very important i think it's very easy as a knots fan or any fan really anybody watching this to be incredibly focused on their own players because they're the ones that they know i think we need to accept that clubs coming to Medellin and this is historical but but certainly now we're obviously doing their homework they know a little bit more about knots than they did on the opening day they would have done an awful lot of prep and preparation for it and we're seeing clubs making very obvious tactical adjustments to deal with the threats that knots pose yeah. um and so you know and credit to those players who are still so Kyle Wotton Cal Roberts for example who are still able to kind of maintain a really high level of performance even though they're facing very um very direct very obvious tactical decisions mm. that the opposition are making so so credit to those players particularly no oh, definitely definitely and um of course something that we want to talk about a little bit as well is obviously uh the injury to Carl Cameron uh looked like it well we know it's his hamstring I think we could all see that when it happened um I've not seen anything from the club yet following scans or anything to suggest how bad that's going to be. But I think the, the general consensus is, is we've got at least a couple of weeks before um, Conor Rawlinson's fit. Um, and and we're not entirely sure how long Kyle Cameron will be out, whether it's a week, two weeks, a month or whatever at the moment. So um, it kind of leaves us a little bit shorthanded there, doesn't it? And it leaves... There's, 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 there's that old proverb about, you know, the indispensable man. And, you know, you put your hand in a bucket of water and pull it out again and look, have a look at the, the hole that's left. Or there isn't one because nobody's supposed to be indispensable. But at this moment in time, for not, I'm not saying that 
losing Kyle Cameron, it, you know, is that he's indispensable. But it's a big loss, especially when you haven't got Connor Rawlinson as well. Um, and, you know, it's just the concern that it gives you that thankfully, well, on the other side, flip side, sorry, thankfully, Alex Lacey was absolutely outstanding um, on Saturday and looks to be back to his 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 former good form again, which is which is great. But obviously, he needs somebody else at the side of him there as well. And we've we've got two players in in Chitson and Brindley that can play those left and right sort of back three positions if need be. But if we have to go to a back four, I know Richard Brindley's done it in the past, but it's not his best position. So it kind of leaves quite a big hole for us there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, first of all, obviously, best wishes to to both the the centre halves who were, who were injured, and like you say, you know what what players to lose really. I, I think, you know, it's not necessarily just what they what they bring to the club in terms of you go you've got Rawlinson's experience, and obviously you've got Cameron in terms of the the leadership skills, but you've also got those those attributes. And I remember a, a very early podcast that we did where we were talking about the future of Notts' defence under under Ian Birchall and and you know, really thinking about Ellis's role that he used to play in that, that centre of the three and really having that kind of dominance and having that, that kind of aerial ability. And we talked about how Rawlinson could do that. Well, obviously, he isn't going to be able to do that, you know, due to his injury. And then the other option at Knotts would have been would have been Cameron, you know, to play to play in into that centre. Uh, and unfortunately, again, we, we've we've lost that. And and although you're absolutely right, that we still have some fantastic strength and depth. And again, without wanting to constantly promote our previous pods, but we talked about the kind of flexibility that we've got in, in the recruitment in terms of making sure players can play a number of positions. Mm. One of the things that I think we've got to question and one of the things that we've got to fill is that where do we get that characteristic from of being kind of aerially dominant, for example, but also making sure that we've got someone who can maintain that playing style of you know ball to feet and making sure we're playing those shorter mid-range passes but i think you know on a wider discussion and this is where hopefully our conversation is going to interest those beyond uh those of a knots persuasion um and that is that you know i think this is where recruitment becomes fascinating doesn't it because mm. you know it, it's not just a case of just going out and and either staying with what you've got and just and just literally you know sometimes it's you, you a case of square pegs in round holes you don't you don't want to be doing that because obviously teams will exploit that but also it's not necessarily just to, out there to to go out and throw money at the situation to particularly not in the national league um you know going out there and and, and just recruiting the very best that you can find uh because obviously there's restrictions there and also you know there's there's thinking about the dynamic both in a sporting sense but also in a kind of club sense as well in a club ethos and i think anybody who recommends a player or talks a player and obviously we're, we're doing this in a very informal capacity needs to think about those dynamics that are going on at club level could because one of my favorite um one of my favorite scenes in in Sunderland till i die talking about recruitment is uh is in the first season where they they talk about kind of how they need to find a striker and the scouting department has produced this list of players who they consider to be available and, and right at the bottom of the list is Zlatan Ibrahimovic um of, of which the uh the the owner and the director sort of says sorry is anyone has someone found a pot of money that i didn't know about or anything yeah and i think although although like i say you know it's it's quite dark humor in terms of laughing at what, what's ultimately been a difficult few seasons for for sunderland i think there's a big comment there about recruitment that it's very easy to go out there and and to just find any solution but context is massively important so so with the conversations we're going to have about the players we're discussing it's not a case of just going out and finding the very best or ty typing in into y scout or, or various other databases trying to think oh the very best player we can do x y and z it's actually trying to contextualize it towards what we know about knots yeah what we know about the style of play what we know about you know what the manager looks for um what we know about kind of the you know the tactical output and stuff and so hopefully it's a conversation that will interest knots fans as well as as well as the wider public absolutely i mean if we have the, if if, if if we consider that for a moment then and and let's let's just put Connor Rawlinson to one side and let's let's talk about Kyle Cameron because obviously he no dis and, and and this is in no means 
in disrespectful to, to to anybody else, Connell or whoever, but but obviously what Kyle Cameron brings to the table is a little bit more than just you know a centre back. We've seen him his marauding runs. Um, he likes to get forward. He's very capable of putting a good cross in. He definitely knows how to get on the end of a header at a free kick or a corner, um, as we've seen to our benefit this season. Um, you know, and these are all things that obviously not are going to have to be looking at, so because that's that's a a, a, a a very complicit part of of the dynamic that Ian Birchnell's got in the team at the moment. That's what he wants to see. You know, we've seen it with Richard Brindley as well. You mentioned Richard Brindley in the past with the fact that he was given the freedom to suddenly drive forward with the ball and what have you. And it's very clear that they're the type of centre-backs that we need, or Ian Birchnell certainly wants, to fit the dynamic of his formations and his style of play moving forward. So it, it does throw up a few, a few problems if you're looking for somebody to cover or replace somebody for a period of time, um, like Kyle Cameron, considering what he brings to the table. Yeah, completely. Um, because again, you know, if I'm the opposition and I'm looking at Notts County as well, I'm seeing that they're deficient on some of those characteristics that you've talked about, you know, that that we're and we're capable of of fulfilling some of those characteristics. So, you know, like I say, those those marauding runs, Chickson can do those, Brindley can do those, you know, and so moving those players around in order to to achieve those. Um, you know, I feel reassured by. It. But if I was an opposition scout and I knew that Rawlinson was out and Cameron was out, I'm, I'm straight away thinking, right, we're, we're going to put aerial balls into the box and we're going to dominate them because even though, you know, Chickson and and, and, and Brindley are, are good aerially, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they'll they'll out jump and, and, and outperform uh, the vast majority of the National League. You know, we've, we've got to remember that we're going to be playing against teams who have that target man system, who, you know, who have that in their locker, who who can play that direct ball. And so it's about making sure that we we kind of answer those questions first, rather than certainly from a fan's perspective, sitting there for 90 minutes on our hands, kind of stressing about every time the ball is going to be played in the box, because we know that we we haven't quite accurately mm. sort of replaced those those characteristics. So you're absolutely right. You know, I think, I think he's a big loss. Um, and like I say, he's been really impressive in terms of you know his performances so far offensively as well as well as defensively um and like i say you know it's going to be a, a tough ask if not to go into the market in whatever form and we're going to look at different types of market if you like in terms yeah. of where solutions could be could be found um and yeah it's, it's going to be difficult to replace certainly all of those characteristics um but even just some of those standout features are going to be quite difficult to to find a like for like replacement Definitely, definitely. So, if we if we cut to the chase, then um, we've been busy having a look around, putting a few options together. You know, we've 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 put our Notts County scouting hats on, um, and we decided to come up with with three players that we felt you know could possibly fit the bill and, and fit into the system that, that, that Ian Birchnell's working at the moment. And to make it a little bit more interesting, we've gone we've gone for one that we would have to buy. Um, we've gone for a, a free agent, somebody without a club at the moment. And then we've had a look at somebody on loan. So um, did you want to kick us off with one of your suggestions? So having had a good look at him, I have to agree with everything that you've, you've said. Um, and the player that we would probably have to pay money for if we were to bring somebody in, considering that that's not necessarily what Knots are going to do. It's yeah. I, you know we, we're not saying that's what Knots are going to do. It's just for the program we've had a look at the three different options to see who we feel would best fit the role. So I'll let you kick off then with 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 our purchase. Who would that be? Yeah, well, like I say, you know we. I suppose before going into all three of these, but particularly the player in question is we've, we've used our knowledge of, of the club and what the club are, are trying to do, you know? So one of the things that we we've discussed sort of off air and talked about is, is Notts's preference for looking at the, certainly looking at the recruitment this season of those kind of younger players to, to sort of develop and move on. So someone who's got a really good solid base. So Notts don't tend to necessarily go for someone 
you know fresh out of a of an academy for their first loan or for their first deal they tend to have gained experience elsewhere uh, but also this opportunity of potential and kind of moving them on so seeing someone on that kind of trajectory and someone who's on a really good trajectory at the moment is Bradbury at, at Halifax um someone who when we look at his stats um when we look at his qualities and, and as you can see here with the position there's an awful lot of crossover between what Cameron can do positionally as well as the fact that we look at his age we look at someone who could possibly see knots you know because I think it's also important to look at things the other way looking at it from the player's perspective that someone might see and no offense to uh to Halifax's uh supporters if they're, they're listening but hopefully he would see a move to knots as being ideal for his career also thinking about being 23 years old thinking about the fact that you may you know it may be a kind of short term let's let's imagine that that this happened and he went in and he'd have a short term run of games you know but also if he dropped out of that first time first team lineup and end up on the bench or whatever you know he wouldn't necessarily see that as a as a major negative at that at this point in his career um things that that stand out is it's that aerial dominance um first of all you know and, and obviously that that comes with height obviously you know we, we saw his stats there in terms of how tall he is now dominant he is someone who has coped fantastically well with the rigors of, of national league someone who um also offers that kind of offensive threat as well so so um you've got the stats to hand haven't you rich you were talking to me off air about the assists yeah and the, absolutely the i he's mean got. he's to to be fair he's played every minute of halifax's campaign so far this season um and he has played in that sort of left center back role as well that that, that carl cameron uh, plays for knots um and i was having a look at his heat maps and things which i haven't got to hand at the moment but um you can see that he's, he's, he's again another player like kyle who very much likes to be quite offensive and aggressive with his play as well um as well as his defensive duties and, and he's actually got two goals and an assist this season so far for halifax so you know there's some real similarities there between the two players really um and when i first looked at the stats you no know, i did think that he does look very similar uh in that respect his his overall when 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 you really break down his stats and you look at his defensive duels and his percentages on those and his percentages on his construction side which is basically his his build up play and his passing and everything it's not the best in the league but he obviously offers, as you said, something that 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 you know that you're going to get that aggression, you're going to get that defensive dominance, you're going to get somebody who's going to want to push forward and 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 try and um, contribute to the to the uh, plus goals column as well. So um, yeah, really interesting pick. I think yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think realizing that this is not a kind of <clears throat> A finished article kind of replacement but actually someone that could be moved on you know looking at the dynamics of knots in terms of you know Ian Birchnell as well as all the other coaching staff who are I mean we've seen it with Ruben we've seen it with a, a few other players I think Ed Francis has come on even though from a fantastic start has come on every game in terms of his you know progress and his kind of awareness and his use of the ball etc and I think we could see that with, with with Bradbury as well and probably would see his stats increase. And I think also, and again, I don't want this to be a kind of dismissive attitude towards towards Halifax, but I think also we've got the squad available to us that maybe those misplaced passes that, that he's got on his data is actually a you know a responsibility of the players around him for making those Absolutely. or maybe maybe not anticipating those movements, whereas we, we have a squad that is very much always aware waiting for that ball and looking looking for that ball forward and so it may be that actually he has got some of those things in his locker just unfortunately the stats are a little bit misleading in the sense of maybe the players around him aren't necessarily anticipating those um anticipating those movements i mean again bringing up a player obviously not a defensive solution but we we had a conversation about jacob berkeley adjipong as well about sometimes looking at his misplaced passes column isn't necessarily always down to the to the player who's making that pass but actually and i remember a, a particular position on the left hand side of knots's knots's 18 yard box where he kind of shaped to shoot and then found a beautiful angle between two players 
which he played the ball through, expecting the the fullback to overlap, and the fullback just didn't read it, and so therefore the fullback was just stood still. And and obviously from a stats point of view, that looks like a misplaced pass, but actually yeah. with with a slightly more alert left hand sided, you know, fullback or winger. That would look like a fantastic through ball and yeah. a great offensive pass, and he, be, he looks on paper a, be, a better player. So, I think Bradbury would possibly benefit from from life at Knotts as well. No, definitely, and and you make a really good point there because if you think back now uh, to some recent games, we've actually seen that with Knotts players. We've seen Ed Francis looking like he's making a a, a, a sort of a, a deep completion pass. Um, and it ends up being cut out. And it's not necessarily being cut out because he's not made a good pass. It's because the guy in front of him has, has just not timed it right or not anticipated it correctly. And we've seen that with, with a few of the players, um, to be fair. Um, so, that, yeah, that is a good point that you make there. So, so Tom, Tom Bradbury at Halifax Town, you know, he certainly ticks, a few, you know, the majority of the boxes for us. But... You know, it would have to be a purchase. There's a lot of work that would have to go into that. We don't necessarily have the time to be able to do all of that, and we understand that. And on the show here, we're just we're just throwing in a few a few options and looking at the different scenarios. Um, okay, so if we move on then, um, and and this is a player that we both picked up on. I think um, currently without club still only 23 years old but with bags of experience this is this is a lad that came through palace's academy um he's been on the bench in the premier league 14 times he's actually played for the first team at, at palace um and spent nine or ten games at the end of last season on loan at Plymouth where he acquitted himself very well, established himself there, um, even managed to get on the score sheet as well. Um, and that's a young footballer called Sam Woods. What yeah, I mean, on Sam? I think one of the things, well, obviously a lot of the things that you've just talked about really is that not certainly want to be bringing players in with that experience that they can rely on and build upon and, and certainly that fits the profile of, of transfer i think also as well looking at someone who's had that premier league grounding in terms of an academy and an academy development and and you know again i'm going to do it again um we've had ryan <laughs> baldy on as well talking about kind yeah. of academies and those sort of things and yeah you know the 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 obviously there's been recent documentaries as well about academy football but kind of that grounding if you think about kind of you know premier league two and those sort of things and and the kind of the under 23 football that they would have had and the diet they've had they developed some fantastic habits i mean obviously you know the, the player we're talking about kyle cameron um has had that diet with newcastle and you can see that coming through in his play um and they've had to kind of kyle's had to add to that with experiences in the lower leagues, etc., and, and here's a player, Sam Woods, who similar sort of age to the, to the previous one, but obviously free, can rely on that kind of solid grounding as well as that experience of going out on on loan and, and, and those sort of things and playing playing league football as well. And so here's an opportunity to to bring somebody in again, bringing across some of those characteristics that we we so like with uh, with Kyle. Um, I think. To, to confront the, the obvious negatives is it's all down to kind of how well his fitness has, has been, yeah. you know, how well he's maintained it. You know, you'd hope that he's at least training with a club, you know, to keep these, you know, to keep fitness going and to keep his, keep his game as sharp as possible. Um, you know, and, and thankfully we're, the games are coming thick and fast in the national league, but it's certainly not as thick and fast as it was during pandemic times where, where clubs are trying to sort of crowbar in as many games as, as, as humanly possible. Um, as well as obviously, hopefully, not so using training time and, and development time in order to bring players up to speed. So, it's it's a great, you know, solution. I think it's a great opportunity to kind of bring somebody in and and do that, and provided that the fitness levels are there and it was managed appropriately, then could be a really uh, a really good piece of recruitment. Yeah, I suppose if, if you look at him, um, he's the kind of player that you might look at and say, okay, let's let's take him on till January. You know, and we'll give him till the end of the year. Um, that will give us all the time we need for the cover for the guys that we've got, and we'll see how he goes. And maybe, maybe there's, you know, there is a bit of a diamond in the rough there. Um, 
you know, again, I have to say, you know, having had a closer look at um, the games he's played in and, and the way he plays, he's quite happy sitting a little bit deeper. He's, he's, he's not as adventurous as as um, Tom Bradbury or, or, or Kyle Cameron, but, you know, he's still pretty solid. He can score, you know, he has scored um, as well. Um, but he has a really high percentage um, for last season in League One um, with um, Plymouth of defensive duels one. He, I mean, I'm talking his his percentages were up in the 80s, and which is which is really impressive. Um, and he can find a pass as well. Now, maybe that's a bit easier a bit further up the leagues when you're playing with better players and, you know, they're, they're anticipating the ball, as you were saying. So maybe that's helped his stats a little bit there as well. But, you know, he's still got to be able to make those passes and, and have that constructive uh, element to his game as well. Um, and he's one that I'd be quite excited to see a bit more of. Um, I'm, a, I'm still scratching my head as to why he's probably not with the club at the moment. We've not done enough digging to find out if there's anything else underlying that's that's causing that. Um, but you know, he 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 was with he's, he was with uh, Crystal Palace right up until um, the end of last season, uh, and obviously let go. So uh, definitely, definitely one that that I'd be very interested to pursue. Uh, and certainly somebody that I think we ought to keep an eye on and see how things progress with him in the future. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you know, one of the things that we enjoy doing is is keeping our eye on how players that we've kind of stumbled across or we find are quite interesting and how they're progressing. And, you know, away from the show, we're, we're, we're very often at kind of chucking those names back in and, you know, making sure that we, we're, we're spotting how players are progressing and stuff. Um, you know, we talked about Ben Fox, didn't we? I was just well, about to about, say yeah. Ben Fox. Yeah. He's going to come back to haunt us, though, isn't he? <laughs> I, I worry so. I worry so, to be honest. It's going to be quite the dynamo. A little bit how we felt about, about Jacob Berkeley Adjipong as well, coming on and doing quite yeah. so well against Knots. Yeah, it's, it's going to be one of those unfortunate negatives to to sort of spot in a player mm. where you think you've got a bit of talent. Yeah. But I think, you know, that's that's the excitement that we get as well is, is kind of... You know, obviously, as as two Knots fans, we hope that Knots' recruitment, and like I say, so far Knots' recruitment has been fantastic. But um, you know, if they if they don't end up at Knots, we're we're equally as fascinated to see how these where these players end up, how they progress, and how they move forward. And and quite a few of those names that we've discussed on previous pods are are doing really well, and it's really good to see. We just hope that they don't do so well at Medellin or against Knots. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that takes us to our third option um this is somebody that again that that you've um brought to the table um and on the face of it when you take everything into consideration it being a loan move the age of the player his positional play where he's coming from all of those elements um it kind of looks like the perfect fit so um Riley Harbottle. Yeah. Um like I say, I think there could be a section of Knots fans and possibly a section of Forest fans who kind of um are perhaps rolling their eyes at the idea of, you know, Knots and Forest kind of reuniting over the over loans and stuff and shall we say some unresolved uh, ill feeling, shall we say, about the Ryan Yates and, and George Grant sort of uh, scenario from a few years ago. But I think as I was talking to one of my one of my Forest supporting friends, you know, things have developed at the club. I mean, I found it very interesting that that Forest under twenty threes were playing at Medellin uh, last night. You know, obviously there's there's been the kind of the training ground mm. uh, relationship as well, and so I think there is a sign of the clubs sort of coming closer together. And here is a player that can kind of really solidify that that relationship and really kind of prove the progress that that seems to be making off the pitch and and within the the understanding of the two clubs. I think, like we've talked about with with some of the previous players, here's a player who's had a fantastic grounding in in academy football. At let's be honest, you know, even though it pains me to to say it, 
a fantastic academy at, at Forest in terms of the education that they provide the players and the the experiences that they've had. I believe I'm right in saying that that Riley Harbottle was actually captain the side previously uh, under 23s, um, which obviously when you consider his age is is a fantastic achievement in itself. Um, someone who you can see in terms of position has got that flexibility to play in any of those three um, sort of positional um, areas, and I think. The reason why that sounds quite perfect is again, you know, obviously we need someone who can play in that kind of central role, uh, that kind of dominant sort of role in between the the slightly more sort of ball playing players on the left and right. But again, there's an opportunity to kind of juggle that around with Harbottle, you know, and 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 maybe introduce him in those slightly lesser aggressive roles than than directly in the centre. Although we'll come on to the fact that he's had experience in the National League uh, in, in a second or two. Yeah. But also, you know, let's look at it from a Forest perspective as well. That if they were to loan him to Notts for a month, two months, whatever, to, to cover our current injury uh, issues, um, they would be looking at a club that obviously are trying to ground, you know, a, a formation and a style that... I think suits players coming out of academy football as well in terms of it being very possession heavy in terms of it being very progressive through the lines instead of just being a, a one directional kind of you know direct ball uh a kind of sort of you know the ball coming back and forth those sort of things i think also you know they'd also look at the fact that okay it's probably going to be an intense set of games in the first month of the loan because again we are short in terms of numbers and whoever comes in will be expected to be at that level and be able to to perform but also let's let's imagine that that Rawlinson or, or Cameron makes a kind of quicker than expected recovery you've got someone on the bench there you can play all the way across that back line uh, and he's therefore a fantastic sub option you know because obviously you know one of the things that Ian Birchall has been very frustrated by and I think one of the reasons why the likes of Frank Vincent haven't been seen by Knotts fans is because of the limitations on the bench. Mm. You know, you need that flexibility in case something goes wrong. Birchall obviously wanted more bodies on the bench to give Knotts that, that increased presence and flexibility. So having a player who can play anywhere across the back, comfortable and experienced at playing anywhere across the back, um, would be would be fascinating. It would mean that even if game time in terms of starts became limited towards the end of the loan, still got those kind of relevant experience of potentially coming coming off the bench and, and and still getting minutes because that you know from a from a forest perspective I think even though under 23 football is is fantastic you know and obviously for the age that he's up still playing under 23 football is completely relevant I don't think you can get any better than than the men's football you know and first team football Absolutely. and playing in front of the crowd and let's face it again you know playing in your hometown still in front of your family and your friends you know, playing in the proximity and, and knowing that you're in the direct eye line of Gary Brazil or Andy Reid and those sort of things. And again, you know, going back to those those loans that that we've talked about previously. You know, Ryan Yates and George Grant flourished yeah. in that given those circumstances. And again, there's no, I see no reason why this loan can't work for for both clubs. Absolutely, and and you you mentioned there as well that his experience has has taken in some. National League football as well because he, he he spent some time last season at Wealdston. Yeah. So yeah. so he's it, you know he's he's not going to um, need to really acclimatise either to the type of football that we tend to face on a weekly basis down down in the National Leagues. Yeah, and I think that that's that's as important for him as a player as it is for for Knotts and their recruitment because you know again Knotts seem to want to be steering away from providing the very first loan experience for a player coming out of academy football you know we, we've had a number of those players and it has been a little bit hit and miss under previous regimes where you're bringing these players in for their very first loan some hit the ground running and are fantastic others really struggle um and so making sure that this is perhaps their second loan in, in this in the sense of harbor but obviously you know some of the players we've talking about is their third it's their fourth move etc um knots want to build on that and want to build you know trajectory and again if i was in forest position because i could imagine someone listening to this and going hang on a minute he's had a national league move does need another national league move but actually and they, i mean this is no disrespect to Wildstone, who who have been fairly impressive so far 
I think there's a there's a subtle difference in terms of a development playing at Medellin in front of the crowds mm. that we have with the infrastructure that we've got. Um, I do think even though it's the same league, there is a step up in development that, that Forrest would benefit from and the player would benefit from. And obviously, Notts would gain some short-term benefit from as well. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, he'd be the loner then. Um, so, looking back then at those those three options, um, I'm taking it that, that he'd be your preferred choice out of the three, would he? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like I say, taking in all the different dynamics that we've talked about, not just the player himself, but also kind of thinking about the dynamics at the club at, at Notts, which again, like I say, good recruitment, whoever's doing it, it needs to be sensitive to the circumstances of, of, of the club and also of the either the selling club or the loaning club or whatever. It ticks every box for me, I, I think, you know, because... Okay you know you, you've got the kind of relationships you've got the geography you've got the style of play you've got you've got everything else that i feel can kind of come together uh, and come to fruition in, in this particular circumstance um and like i say you know fingers crossed that that knots make a move like this um because like i say i think it'd be exciting for fans of, of, of both clubs really okay do you think i mean just just looking at it and the other two guys that we've spoken about there um, is there the capacity at Notts at the moment to possibly dip into the market rather than, than the loan market and, and bring somebody in? So somebody like Sam Woods, you know, he's not with the club at the moment. I said earlier, is he the sort of guy that you look at and say, well, I tell you what, you know, we'll give you till the end of, you know, December and then we'll we'll review it from there. Um, because... You know, you'd like to think as well that a player in his position, assuming he's fit and he's available still and, and what have you, um, yeah, he's been playing at a higher level previously. But you mentioned the fact that Knots have obviously got the structure around them at the moment that would be, you know, um, able to possibly entice players from a slightly higher level. We're going to, have to look at Matty Palmer for, for, for yeah. starters, you know. Um do, do you think it's out of the question that, that they might go that way or do you think that they're very much going to be going into the loan market? I don't think it's completely out of the question. I mean, I think that's that's the fascinating thing of of being a Knotts fan really is that although it's, it's made us, obviously the reason why we're doing this is it's kind of awoken us to kind of recruitment and kind of data-led recruitment and kind of recruitment-led issues. I think also there's an air of mystery towards, you know, towards his own model. You know, obviously we use Y Scout data and we look at those sort of things, whereas Knotts's recruitment using football radars data is a little bit kind of shrouded and a little bit more mystery, and that that makes it fascinating. So yeah. there is a very good chance that the the solution that that Knotts have found is very much on a, a completely different plane to what we're talking about. Yeah, um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think also as well. You know, again, I, I think about. Rawlinson, we had to retain him. We had to offer him something at the start of the season or at the end of last season to retain him because he would have been had interest, I'm sure, from from other mm. clubs to bring Cameron in as well, particularly from the the circumstance that he was in last season. We had to offer him something, and I think thinking about squad stability, thinking about the impact it might have on those players, if you brought in a permanent threat, if you like, to to either of their two positions. Although, as I'm sure, as professionals, they would accept it and you know puff out their chest and, and do the very best to to win that position back. Um, it's a risky, it's a risky attempt. It's a risky sort of strategy, I think, because again, when you when you've spent your pre-season bedding in a squad and getting everybody used to each other and understanding that dynamic, throwing in another player who who challenges that dynamic a little bit or makes everybody sort of question their own their own position and the, the solidity of it, considering Notts' fantastic start to a season, could be, you know, could, could be, again, could be quite a challenging move. Um, I think the free agent market is fascinating. You know, I think we're in a, we're in an unusual time in the transfer market. I think there's an awful lot of talent out there that that has not been picked up. Um, and I think there's, there's an opportunity for some club, whether that's Notts or whether that's somebody else to, to maybe try and establish a development squad, you know, to try and put an under 23 squad together or something where you bring these sort of free agents in as well as those players who aren't playing regularly, get them fit. Because again, you, you might have some fantastic options out there that just mm -hmm. need 
a few 90 minutes and a bit of TLC. Um, and obviously Woods is one of those players that, that I would recommend mm -hmm. not or anybody uh, looking at really. So it's going to be fascinating in terms of the solution. And obviously we hope that one of the three solutions we've suggested um, happens because obviously that that would be that would be a dream for both of us. But like I say, it will just be fascinating how it how it resolves yeah. itself. Definitely, definitely. Well, before we go, well, I've got one more question for you. So we're altering them away on Saturday. As we record this, we're currently 8.30 on the Tuesday evening, folks. Um, we've not heard anything from the club with regards to anybody coming in to cover Kyle Cameron. Um, if we don't have anybody by Saturday, what does Ian Birchnell do? It's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because again, I'm really trying to think about kind of, I don't want to back four with sort of Chickson and Brindley as the centre, not because I've not got any faith in them, but because I know exactly what the opposition are going to be thinking and doing. And that is kind of bombarding that box. And when you consider the goals that we've conceded as, as uh, at Knotts, it's been largely through that kind of, that, that big ball into down the middle, all right, or, or attacking that middle and attacking and exploiting that kind of hesitancy in that central position. Not necessarily making that down to Slocum or Cameron or, or Rawlinson or anybody, but the, that's where teams seem to have, have focused their their attacks and, and had some mm. success. Um, so I almost want to take away that narrative at the moment. I think one of the options that I was thinking about, but I'm not even sure whether I, I like it, is if we retain that three. But we've also got Ed Francis, who has played yeah. defensively, slightly more left-hand side. He was more sort of left back at Harrogate rather than a left-hand side centre. But again, could we put him in on the left-hand side centre, which then forces Chickson into the middle, which forces Brindley to the right? Um, and then obviously we start to bring in another midfield option, bearing in mind that we've got Jim O'Brien, who's been sort of more of an impact sub in, in midfield. I mean, he's not a bad option to have in midfield. Obviously, Frank Vincent, again, is someone who's who's itching to to get minutes. So that might be an opportunity to do that. I, I still think we're missing that that dominance, if I'm honest. I still think yeah. that even with three, even with those three that I've mentioned, but I just think having those three in the centre, you know, three is better than two, you know, in a, a risky pass or whatever, you, you've got that coverage. You see, I'd probably, I understand exactly where you're coming from with that. And I, I can visualise everything that you're saying. Um but in my mind, well, there's, there's there's two things. Are we going there worrying about our defence when we go away to play Altrincham, or should we go in there thinking, right, how are we going to not worry about the defence and focus wholly on, you know, the, the offensive side? But I still think that even if we haven't got a replacement for cover by then, I, I would still possibly look at a back four and it doesn't matter whether it's Chickson or, or Joel Taylor at left back. I think they both do do a great job on the left there. Um, but I'd be tempted to pull Alex Lacey over to the left side of the centre-back role and move Richard Brindley in at, alongside him and then probably bring Kelly Evans in at right back. And, and then it just gives you that a, a little bit of a platform of the back four then for you to be able to, to build on. Um, you know, obviously... Brindley's going to be able to take over that Cameron role of, of being that marauding centre half, centre back, you know, looking to break through the lines and everything. And we can still have that kind of play, I suppose. Um, but it just gives us a little bit of security as well. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, for a start, I apologise to Alex Lacey because I think I'd. I'd oh, yeah, you him never mentioned him. You dropped him. For absolutely no reason. Yeah, for absolutely no reason whatsoever. I mean, that would have been. Yeah. Man that would have been on Saturday. Quite, and he's been dropped yeah. already by Colin Sisson. Yeah, yeah, quite, yeah, quite, sensa like. quite a sensational tactical decision there. No, but I think thinking about it, you know, one of the, we, we're obviously talking about the the three and the dynamic of the three. Yeah. And just something that you said there got me thinking that obviously we're assuming that the centre of the three always has to be the aerially dominant and a kind of almost the yeah. attacking force, if you like, and, and being on the front foot. I wonder whether we play a slightly higher line and Lacey actually sweeps. Yeah. So actually we don't, we don't kind of, you know, sort of like press from the, from the center of the, of the three. And he's the one who goes out and attacks and tries to win the aerial duels. But actually the left and right hand side are the ones who, who push up a little bit higher on, on, 
on the forward and actually Lacey's always looking to drop off because obviously yeah. that fantastic range of passing that he's got could really kind of unlock options yeah. on that kind of on that deep one and again I think it goes back to something that we said earlier on you know this is credit to the recruitment all the way back into pre-season is the fact that we've lost two very significant players and although Absolutely. you know although I would I would feel more reassured if not replaced that aerial dominance in the back line the fact that we've got so many solutions to this particular problem so much so that I forget Alex Lacey even as an option um you know emphasizes just how how rich we are with with, with those solutions because that hasn't yeah, yeah. been typical of of knots and knots as sort of squad management for for certainly a long time that I can remember yeah no I think you make a very good point there as well and and it is credit to the work that's been done behind the scenes there with Ian and the team um and everybody involved um and it does leave us in in quite an enviable position I think as well in this league so um we can take a lot of um solace from that I suppose moving forward definitely well, look, it's been absolutely fascinating again, Colin. Um, I've really enjoyed that one. Um, for those of you that are watching or, or listening, again, those those three players that we've mentioned were Tom Bradbury, who's currently at um, FC Halifax Town, Sam Woods, who's ex Crystal Palace and currently without a club, and Riley Harbottle, who's currently with the under twenty threes at Forest, but has had some experience at Wilston last season as well. They're just a few names for you to to keep an eye on. I'm sure we'll be uh, bringing them up again uh, at different times with with future podcasts. Again, um, something that we don't tend to be very good at on this podcast is is promoting things very well. So um, yeah, obviously we'd love you to subscribe. Um, so you know, by all means, click on that subscribe button in the. You'll get to find out when the pods are happening before anybody else, I think. Um, like and comment as usual. You'll find us on Twitter, Analyst Bar. Um, Colin's on Twitter, Colin Sisson, and obviously I'm not stats. So uh, we'd love it um, if people wanted to get involved with the conversation further and, and maybe give us a, a bit more to talk about in future podcasts as well. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. And until next time, we'll... Good luck and let's hope uh, for another three points on Saturday. Fingers crossed. Cheers.